My name's Henry Colt and uh, I'm a resident of the Greyhound and I came here originally about five years ago to help the owner, Lou, with his problems with his property. And the problems are that the physical building and the documents for it don't match what other people keep telling him he owns and lives in. And because it's a pub, it's covered under all sorts of statutes and legal requirements. And so you get all these public officials coming down telling him he's got to do this, that or the other because the pub that they've got on their records, um, he's not allowed to do something or other because their records say that the pub's not what it actually is, but what they say it is. And as I said to him, well, they can say what it is for forever and a day and they're not going to change the building and they're not going to change the documents. So tell them to go away and mind your own business. There are certain things you can't do anything about and changing this physical building and the documents which are 200 years old can't be changed by a council official thinking that they can say it's something else and they're going to enforce legislation on it because there is no reality for them to force that legislation on. It's a phantom and you can't enforce a phantom in law. There is no, there's no legal process for it. Okay, fine. Well, what's going to happen is Lou's going to defend his property and there's going to be a criminal trial and in that criminal trial you will have to produce your evidence of your phantom and Lou will have to produce his evidence of his pub. I know who I'm going to back. <laughs> <laughs> because anybody can come here and see for themselves the evidence but they don't want to. The solicitors don't want to come here, the cops don't want to come here but the police have been here and they have looked at the documents and they accept the pub and the documents, and so they've ended up throwing all these people with their court orders and everything off the property and saying, well, sorry, you've got to go back to court and sort it out. The land registry themselves have said that the court orders that have been obtained conflict with Lou's registered title, which even though it's not registered properly, is registered sufficiently well for him to say, I live here, I've got my deeds here, they are, who are you, what do you want? And um, it's causing a problem because these public officials and people won't stop doing what they're doing. They're processing a phantom. And despite all my best efforts at explaining this to them and long drawn out court cases, because I'm a layman acting on behalf of a, a Greek Cypriot who can't read and write, who's legally disadvantaged by this process, uh, as an Englishman, I'm I'm insulted actually that, that they're treating him in this way because there's no reason for him to do it. It's discriminatory. Just because he can't read and write, there's no reason to pick on him. And when they've got it wrong and they've been told they've got it wrong and given evidence that they've got it wrong, I think it's incumbent upon them to admit that they've got it wrong and do something to put it right. The most recent court case, which was done in April this year, by somebody who's bought this pile of rubbish from the man who was fighting with Lou for 20 years, who subsequently died, this new person has taken over. Is this the is purpose? Carrying on, doing exactly the same thing, using exactly the same argument, using a very unscrupulous law firm and barrister to maintain that what they've got is an entitlement to register this pile of rubbish and say it's their property. And of course it's still on the lease that Lou's got, and it's still registered on the lease that Lou's got, and it's still in his ownership, occupation and control. But they say, because there's a court order saying it's somebody else's and they've bought it from somebody else, then it gives them a right to register it at the land registry and say it's theirs. And uh, in, the, in the most recent uh, episode with them, Lou got arrested defending his property because he had a hoarding board on the side of the pub with, from which he drew up an income. And they arrested him on the basis that it was her property rather than his. So we've now got a police investigation going on as to why the police were allowing her to claim it was her property without seeing any paperwork when they'd already seen Lou's on previous occasions and had thrown everybody else off the property. So 
essentially this, this bit that I've shown you outside here, which is the, the bit under the forecourt outside the building, which nobody seems to understand, because all the plans which everybody deals with in the courts, they're all upstairs. They're at first floor level, because the road is at first floor level. So everybody keeps talking about that as if it was land. But there's this physical building underneath it, which is the most important thing that you have to get your head around. It's a three-dimensional physical structure. You can't grow a tree in it, as I keep saying to Lou. You can grow a tree in land. You can't grow a tree in that forecourt out there. There's a building underneath. And that building is occupied and in use, and has been all the life of the property since 1814. And it doesn't matter what anybody says in 2002 or 2004 or six or whatever, they can't change it. You know, it's just a distortion of the truth. But when you get there, they're like this. You know, yes, Mr. Cox, what is it you want? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's also very expensive. You know, um, the reason they can't hear is because the court itself is judging its own cause. It's the court that's made the error. It was the court that decided that that was land and that somebody else owned it. Lou wasn't in the court case. It was the freeholder who was taken to court. Lou's the leaseholder. So the freeholder had no say in it because in that court case, what was being decided was whether or not the freeholder had granted a lease. Yes, they did. It's just that the person who was in the court claiming that he had the lease didn't have it. He was lying. I can prove it. I've said to the police, I have all the documents, I've got all the proof. What more do you need? There was perjury committed in order to obtain a court order. That's a criminal offence. You can't then mm -hmm. process the results of that crime and say, oh, well, we're now going to make that into a valid legal title. It doesn't fit with the legal title registration process, which is laid down by statute, of what is required to register a property to be owned by somebody. Who's the freeholder? It's, uh, it's the company, all the which is Mrs. Owens. Oh, I see. So they own the freehold and the Because of that relationship between him and his wife, because he is he is the tenant of his own wife's tenant. I see. Right. They keep saying, oh yes, it's the Loisers. The Loisers own this, that, yeah. The law says they are to be treated separately. Because mm, they're separate companies. Well, yeah, but she is only the director of the company. She does not own the property. The company mm, owns it. The company property. owns it. And the company cannot occupy the property because it's only the freeholder. It's granted the lease. Mm. So the company is only in, in receipt of a revenue. Right. It's the owner of the building in receipt of a revenue. That's him. For a term of years, the lease is to Lou. Right. And until they get that sorted out, you can't then sort out whether or not, and if and when and how, he has subleased any part of it. You have to sort out the original documents first. Right. Because everything that derives out of it, it can't be resolved until you've corrected the relationship between the freehold and the leasehold. Right. And at the moment, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, well, what we'll do is we'll take all the divisions and divide it up and court orders and everything, and we'll try and force it back down through the old documents to make it fit so that we can get it so that this is registrable on the freeholder. And I'm saying, well, you can't do that. Right. The, the freeholder hasn't got any documents to support any of that crap. Do you know who originally built the building as yeah. it was? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's up to this wall here before the rest of it was yeah. put All on. All documentation going back to 1822. And that's a release from a previous lease of one. So there was a building the, here probably in the 18th House century. House of Lords Law Library records go back to the late 1700s, yeah. Right. And when was Lee Bridge Road built? Because that was the last turnpike in London, wasn't it? Oh, when it was built, I don't know. It, it, it's been a road across the marshes pre-1700. I thought and it was later than that. No, no, it was pre-1700 because the, it was it was in use before it became a turnpike. Oh, I see. But, but what would the point have been? Because the ferry came down the end of um, what was Copper Mill Lane. No, because no, it was Copper on Mill the Black Lane. Path. Pardon? On the, it was on the Black Path. 
couple of mil lengths way up by Hyde Bridge at the moment. Yeah, but the, the thing meandered down to the where the ferry is. That's that's the ferry is where the Anchor and Hope. Yeah, yeah, but no one would have gone that way from Wolfram Street. Yeah, if it's all, 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 all the channels have been changed over the years. Duckett mm -hmm. was the one who changed everything. Yeah. Right, Duckett owned. Duckett was involved with the pub. Right? Who, who's Duckett? Duckett was the the, the, the guy entrepreneur the engineer who did the lead navigation, and he owned most of the land around this area as one of the directors, I believe, of the brewery. His involvement was with the brewery who owned the land, and the brewery had acquired the land around this area. They had huge parcels of land, which included the land through which Duckett was going to put his infamous cut, which is now what's known as the Lee Navigation Channel. And it was all done under private act of parliament. Um, he was uh, obviously quite well healed and well connected and had the right people in the right places and managed to get his private act of parliament to build this canal system through this part of the land. And once it got built, there was a problem with there wasn't enough water on the Lee, on the Lee River. So again, another private act of parliament, way up in Hertfordshire, he had to bring a cut through from the River Stolt to feed into the River Lee to keep it topped up with water so that the canal wouldn't um, lose its surface level and leave the River Lee dry because the River Lee was still um, providing water for the wetlands that was down on the marshes. Um, I'm not sure, I, don't, I mean there, there obviously is more documentation than I've found and then, you know, I don't know quite where, where it would be likely to be found but I know there's a lot of records for the pub that are held in public record that I haven't, haven't accessed. I've located files and, there are records to do with the, the original breweries for this place that go back to the early 1800s or late 1800s. Um, but um, I'm not sure how much of that information would give a connection with Duckett and how much would show how, what, what areas of land they'd actually taken over. But I know it was when I was researching something to do with Bishop Stalford, um, that there was there was stuff in the, that documentation which related to the uh, acquisition of the large parcels of the marshland, um, which were which were necessary for this trench to be dug through, um, because they had loads of Chinese and Irish workers mm. to make the canal. Um, there were accidents, uh, cave-ins and things, and there was all sorts of things that were recorded. It's quite, quite an interesting history in itself, probably in the archives of um, British Waterways or something by now, I should think. Somewhere, the environment somewhere hidden where they don't want you to find it. Mm. Um, when did they build it? It was, it was in the late 1780s, I think, uh, that the original well, different bits were, 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 were built at different, different times. Different dates. The Hackney Cut was much later than the rest of it, for yeah. instance. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they'd build locks and then they'd build another bit and the lock wasn't needed. So as you go along the River Lee, you come to lots of locks that just aren't there anymore. Yeah. You but know, like the but this, stretch, this stretch relating to the Lee Bridge Road, of course there wasn't a Lee Bridge originally. There was a ferry. And when this was a private turnpike. The pub was a, a, a stop-off point along the route out of the city going towards Epping um, because the, the area was, you know, because it was all marshland and the, the only way, means of travel was coach and horses. This was a staging post. This was where the coach and horses used to pull in and stay overnight and then go off on their journey again. Um, stop for meals and all that sort of thing. I, I um, believe there was some kind of tram one of, at one, one of the well. um, One of the things that I found in one of the bits of documentation was talking about the need to, to stop over at the Greyhound 
to escape the footpads and highwaymen <laughs> uh, who, um, who were renowned for holding up the coaches on, on the way out of the city. Um, but nowadays you're more likely to get the footpads and highwaymen at the ground. Uh, we are <laughs> more likely to get them coming round here telling you they're council officials. <laughs> Telling you what you can and can't do at the great end. Um, yeah, some of the old fables, the sort of Robin Hood story, all seem to be appropriate to the way people were living at the time, because there were people who had land and people who lived on the land, in the common land. Um, and there's not much in our history that's written about the common man living on the common land and the common rights that we had. And many of those rights are still in force today and are still the backbone of our legal system. In fact, the, the, the things people think of as being criminal offences are actually civil common law offences. Theft, assault, uh, trespass are all common law offences that go back nearly a thousand years in our history. What was here before 1822? Um, well, this was marshland. It's still shown on the land registry plans at this moment. Uh, and the rear of this property is shown as being marshland um, because part of this land, when it was enclosed by the, by the imposition on the land of the railway to the east and the canal to the west, um, th this piece of land was triangulated with the with the road at the front, the railway and the, uh, the railway and the canal, making a complete triangle with, with an intersection at the north end, which is way up there. Um, and that pet, that one parcel of land was then enclosed and went into the ownership of one person, and it was subsequently then leased off and divided off and that's the origins of when the Great and Lease first started and the records that I've found show a release of a, of a previously running lease from the late 1700s um, which was released in 1822 which was again released again in 1840 and the reason for the origins of the lease which this pub now sits on the 1840 lease which is the running document on the pub at the moment. The reasons for its existence was the 1836 Railway Act, which allowed the bridge, which is now joined to the pub by a later amendment to that act, um, which is now joined to the physical building of the pub so that the pub and the bit in front of the pub that used to be a draw up on the old lease is now joined to the bridge which is now built on the land which also belongs to the pub outside and the right of way which is the other side of the Lee Bridge Road on what they call the Lammas Road which is actually a private road belonging to the pub it's on the lease and the reason it's on the lease is that it was in the Railway Act of 1836 that the the bridge was only allowed to be built across the property provided the right of access to the property wasn't impeded. So the right of access to the property was part and parcel of that Act of Parliament saying the bridge can only be built across the property as long as we can still get to it. So the access to the pub became the first arch under the bridge this side. That was put into the 1840 lease. That's Which is the legal just the other right side of access. this wall. Just the other side of this wall. And the coach and horses used to come through there and the line of the old pub that ended here to the side of it was where the coach and horses used to go through into the stables in the backyard. And the drinking troughs and the rings on the wall are still there showing where the horses used to be tethered for a drink as they came through, or where they were sometimes left indoors. It was a bit warmer in here, I think. Um, but as I say, the, the bit that's now covered outside is on a later lease, which was done in 1888. Um, and that was as a result of, again, an amendment to the 1836 Railway Act, which allowed the construction of the what's now 
called the Forecourt, which is the roofed area outside the pub, which links the pub to the bridge, and includes that area into a new lease of 1888, such that the pub and the area under the forecourt and the area of the arches, and it included the other arches as well, uh, it all becomes the ground floor of the new lease, of the 1888 lease, which, until we can sort out the 1840 lease, as far as Lou's concerned, doesn't exist. Was, was any of this tied into the con consolidation of the railways, into the Great Eastern Railway? You know, when they took Eastern Counties and all, um, all the other little it ones? It might have been. That might have been when they had to do the amendment. Mm. But it, I think what it was, the, the, the pub was actually being built in 1840. It was still under construction. And the builder went bankrupt and was put into the debtor's prison. And so at the time of the Railway Act, when they were bringing the, when they were bringing the bridge across the property, they had to deal with the debtor who was in prison. So it was actually in the Railway Act as dealing with the debtor in prison. And so it was all, so all that documentation is there showing that, that in order to, to resolve the problem, the, there was this guy, I think he was a solicitor, who actually dealt with it all and who became owner of another piece of land which was to the west of the property which was added on to the original 1840 lease, which made the bigger 1888 lease. Mm. Um, so what fascinates me with all this is that when you gave me a copy of the Railway Act, it lists all of the people who were affected right, yeah. by the expansion of the yeah. railway. Well, and that's included in there, the strip of land. Yeah. And it gives the names of the people who had the, the Lammas strips, the rights to the hay. So they were, you know, the, the middle sort of people and the yeah. gentry. They weren't, you know, the, yeah. the commoners yeah. who had the rights of common grazing. Yeah. They well, were people who had the hay. Yeah. And, right and there, one yeah. of them was a debtor. And I presume that, that, that was the, one the had chap the from here. Yeah. And I, I couldn't quite understand what all that was about. Oh. John Burgess. John Burgess was the first chair of the Reconstituted right, yeah, Committee. Right, John Burgess. Well, John yeah. Burgess had documentation that was to do with this marshland here. He's still around, you know. He's had a couple really? of strokes. Oh, well, I saw him last we'll year try, in the we'll drum. try and see him and see if he, he won't speak get to me. Well, get somebody to go and see him. See him I'll him ask Ron Bateman. Because somebody ought to go and see him before he goes, because he had a mind of him. I know he Absolutely did. Loaded. I know he used to come and to meetings. I looked at some of it, but you know, he he was a bit grumpy. But I think he'd be willing to to sort of like give his information over to if he people does, yeah. if he thought it was going to a good cause. Well, you I, know, I, he doesn't want he, him to go to one. He was very friendly to me when he last seen me, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, John Spears has got a lot of stuff as well, you know, yeah. from Seymour allotments. Yeah. And he uses the, you know, well, marshalling fields anyway every day, you know, takes yeah. his dogs for walks over there. I was saying to you, one of the things that's shown on our plans, because of this right of access that used to mm. come to there, for 40 years, whilst that 1840 lease was in use and the right of access was through the arch, people used to come across the common land to the pub. Yeah. So there was a public right of way for 40 years across that land. Oh, it's it's shown on the, on the documents as being a track going yeah. across. Well, that's why they had to put the steps to run in. Down, it used to run down the side of the river. Yeah. Well, yeah, down the side of Shortland Stream. Well, I call the river. Yeah. Well, the only, the only bit of Shortland Stream you can see now is the bit where it just pops out. Where, where it, the other side of the golf course. Yeah, the other side of the golf course. Where, where it, um, where it um, pops out yeah. is where it ran into a drainage ditch over which there was much hilarity. Which was put in by um, no, which That's one was it? Mm, it, 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 it was That's basically the drainage ditch. Yeah, the side of the golf course. It was basically the drainage ditch from the houses that Courtney Warner built at Clementina Road, and there was a there was a lot. Yeah. 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 So and it joined in with um, with Shortland Stream, which was the boundary between Seymour Fields and Marsh Lane Fields. Seymour Fields was open space, but it wasn't known as the, um, at the time, in 1896 when they took it. It was just open space, <laughs> and there were no Lammas rights over it at that time. Um, I don't know who owned it. I, I used to know. I've well, I, think, I think you'll find... I don't, know, I don't know how far you've traced your history back. Um, my knowledge 
going back many, many years, my knowledge of history of this area, and this goes back to being a kid growing up around the area, there was a guy that my parents used to know who knew someone who lived south of the river, somewhere in Kent, and he said that it was all on documentation somewhere at the City of London, mm -hmm. that it was all covered under the Epping Forest land. Yes. And it came from the Queen Elizabeth the First times as being yeah. Epping Forest lands, and it goes almost to the South Downs as Epping Forest. Well, that's interesting. That would be at the Guildhall Library, presumably. Right. So that's that's another source of, of yeah. Because yeah, I, mean, I, I got into a lot of this through trying to figure out why on earth. I don't yeah, I, do, I, do I, do I do find it a great shame that as a local authority that we haven't actually got someone who's actually interested in recovering the history of the area. Oh, we have. Um, There's a couple um, of people up there. So Mike and, Perkins. And somebody and who's John looking Duncan. at it from the perspective of the lost common rights. Because, yeah. because our legal system is so dependent on those common rights, we none of us would have any rights at all if it weren't for our common rights. Our whole legal system is pivoted on and depends upon them. And all the statutory rights that have been written on top are all nothing in comparison to those common rights. If those common rights are extinguished, which is, seems to be the, the process that's been done by the likes of these compulsory development yeah. corporations, yeah. Well, it's, it's the extinguishment of our old common rights mm -hmm. and all the old documentation to do with anything which identifies it. And this pub's a prime example, one of the reasons Wolf and Forest wants rid of this pub, because it identifies the Railway Act as being tied to this building. And that railway act shows that the, it was a private act of parliament that produced this road here. And there are things written in that statute of what the legal responsibilities are of the person who takes over, who inherits the liabilities from that act of parliament. Of all the things that were required by parliament to be done, if you're going to build that road across that land, these are the terms and conditions under which it is done. Now, whoever inherits that right of that bridge has to comply with those rights. Mm -hmm. And that's the local authority at the moment, as far as yeah. we can find out. The problem is, what's actually going on, and what people don't seem to realise, is all of these things, that done this whole thing about having the Olympics, when you go back through the plans, going back to the early 70s, right, that, the East End of London has been ripe for development for donkey's years since the war. Right? It was always West London that got all the development and all the planners in London have always had this East London earmarked as being somewhere where they're going to make a lot of money. Now, it was always resisted by the local people, local councils who have traditionally been voted in, have been voted in as Labour because they didn't want the developers coming in and taking over. So they voted Labour and oh, Labour will look after it for us and Labour will do this Labour. <coughs> Well, we've all seen the fine mess that they made of it, with all the tower blocks that they put up yeah. everywhere and the yeah. nightmare scenarios that they've done. Mm. And, sorry, the East End of London, as far as I'm concerned, has been destroyed by the people who were supposed to be looking after it, rather than looked after. And it amazes me that yeah. they came out about 10, if 15 they, years ago and knocked all the tower blocks down, and they've got their nose and so they looked look after their own houses in the way that they've looked after this area, for the people of this area, their houses would have been down on top of them. You know, and we would have said rest in peace. In the November before last, I went to the West Waltham State Community Council meeting. I'm never going to go to another one, it's a waste of time. And I went in there and the LDA were doing a presentation. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions which I'd written down. I wasn't going to waffle, I wasn't going to say a lot. I just wanted to know how much land the LDA had already bought in Waltham Forest how much of that land was in Leebridge and Leighton wards, because that's Leighton Marshes, which is obviously yeah. the first large piece of open land north of the Olympic site, and if they've yeah. got to find land to move people to, Leighton Marshes is where they'll put it. Um, and I've actually had that verbally from the LDA's own solicitor, mm -hmm. who's another Queen's Park Rangers fan. Things I know about solicitors. And I wanted to know how much land they were looking at, other than that already purchased. I tried to ask the questions and was shouted down by five or six Labour councillors, including Clyde Lokes and Terry Weiner. 
And they were just hollering at me and shouting things like, where do you live? How much council tax do you pay? You don't live here, you've no right to speak. And they were just braying at me. I mean, there was absolutely no other word for it. It, it was like being, it was like being in, a, in a, you know, an animal yard. And I, I couldn't make myself heard. Every time I tried to ask these questions, and in the end, um, the person who was trying to chair this meeting um, said, I think it might be best if you ask your question outside. So I went outside and you get one of these, you know, fresh from university, um, you know, very skinny women. I don't know if you know what I mean, but there's yeah, this yeah. particular type. And, the, you know, they all speak with very high voices. Yeah. yeah? And uh, I spoke to her. It turned out she'd been in post two days, mm. hadn't a clue what she was talking about or what I was asking about. I will get you an answer, she said. I took her email address. Two weeks later, I wrote to her by email and I said, I still haven't heard with an answer. I eventually got an answer in April and it said, I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, and it was yeah. like, they knew perfectly well that yeah. they had already bought the British Gas Yard site yeah. or had been given it. They already knew how much land the Lee Valley Park was giving them yeah, under yeah. a commercial agreement that because it's commercial they can't disclose, despite the fact that they're both publicly funded public bodies. So where's the commercial well, confidentiality? I mean, all of the Lee Valley Park's accounts are supposed to be open to public scrutiny. You remember when I was saying to you about the Railway Act? Yeah. Right, well, there were other sections of the Railway Act that related to the land over there. Yes. Now, that railway comes up from Stratford. Yeah. And it was it was the Stratford branch that's coming up on the GNER. Yeah, up to Cambridge. Up to Cambridge. Now, when that railway was put through, again, it's the same as the road. It was put through across private land, mm. and it became, by Act of Parliament, a public right of way because that's what a railway is. Mm. You sit in a carriage and you are on your right of way to somewhere else. So it became... On payment right of the appropriate fare, I think you'll find it says in the Act. Well, it doesn't matter, <laughs> it's still the right of way. <laughs> Not if you haven't paid for your ticket. <laughs> well, well, but you, I know what you mean. Whether you pay for your right of ticket or not, <laughs> you know, they created a right yeah. of way across public land. Yeah. Right? Um, so that right of way was established by an Act of Parliament. Mm. Now, also, the lands that were surrounding it were all clearly identified. And one of the things that was identified on that stretch of land over there, which went down what they called the New Road, mm. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, the, the Flake Road. Um, the, the, the Orient Way, or whatever right. they call it now. Well, yeah. that was such a scam when that was done, oh, because yeah. that was illegal. Yes. Right? And I said so at the time, because yeah. there was evidence that that land was leased. It was on a thousand year lease. And the railway company knew that it was on a thousand year lease. It was in their documentation. Now something about this now, something about this came up lease. at the meeting we had with the legal services department recently. There are a load of bits of land which their maps show in yellow. Yes. Which is land that the railway had a right to use if they wanted, but could give back if they didn't. And what seems to have happened is the land that subsequently got used for the freight road was land that had been used by the railway but was no longer going to be used um, because the sidings were being cut back. And when they moved the railway over to the other bit, that piece of land became redundant for railway use earlier than the rest of the sidings. Yeah. Now that seems to be what the council were claiming. Whatever the matter, in 1959, the piece of land that they never had used was certainly given back, at least to the Corporation of Orphan Forest, and that is where Mr. Right. Mosley grazes his horses. Right, okay. Now, you spoke earlier about the land being owned by the council. I'd like to put something right on the record. The council is a corporate body. Yeah. By constitution, the people who run it are elected yeah. to run it on behalf of the public who elect them. That's right. The land which everybody says the council owns, the council don't own. It's vested in. It's vested in the mm. council on behalf of the public. Yeah, in fact the 1904 Act says vested in. At no place does it say it's it public land. It. Yes, it's, it's not public the council's land. land. No. I do wish 
ordinary people speaking in ordinary terms would not keep giving the council land which they do not own. Mm. Because councillors go into power and they go there and then they come in and I say, oh, you can't do that, that's our land. As if it's not our land. They've made a distinction. It's their land, not our land, right? The phrase to use is our land. Mm. The Americans, the reason their constitution says we the people is because they were so pissed off with this tyrann tyrannical attitude that's creeping back into use in this country again, right? Of, it's ours, it's not yours, it's ours. I, it, would, it would be nice to have all these things all tied up. It was. And put as, you know, well, it, it amazes me. Here we are in the age of the internet. We had the Agenda 21 people. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the meeting of the minds, 176 countries was it, who decided that we needed a new agenda, something new to talk about. And what they done, they stole on it. They're talking about terrorism. And the old agenda and the old planning processes and all the old crap that was causing the very problems that we were supposed to be dealing with is still the agenda in the 21st century. Mm. Why? Why? There we were, we, we were in 1997 or something. Well, was before that. Opportunity. And 1991, I was, wasn't and it? I was because there was 10 years it. to implement it. Yeah, but I was talking about it with people and saying to the local people, yeah. don't let them steal the agenda. This is our opportunity to make the agenda what we want. With all the tools at our disposal, we've got the internet, we could have our own website, we could have our own information. Yeah. All this stuff you and I sit and talking about could all be on the web. Could be there for anybody to access. And people could have time to put it all there. People could have their own right to put stuff in on the website. You know, this YouTube. Why, why haven't we got our own local YouTube thing What's going YouTube? on? Well, the thing Google have just bought. People just phone in, send in their videotapes and things that they do oh, with dear. their cameras and send them in. Little two minute shorts. This is, this is, what, this is what's causing the obesity epidemic in Britain. It's everyone sitting there watching the internet instead of getting out and doing things. Yeah, but the thing is, <laughs> it's all that, you know, all that stuff that people have got in their heads that nobody knows about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's all that stuff. If it could be all incorporated onto one site. Yeah. So when you want to know something about the local area, you get it from local the perspective of the local people yeah. and all the information they've got in their nuts. I just sit there and just sit and talk for five minutes. Go into a cubicle and just, you know, thought, there it is, okay, stick that on the web page, mm. hang on. What's this? Oh, it's Joe Blogs talking about something. Oh, there's so much of that. I mean, like, yeah, if, it every would year, be I mean, so yeah. much fun. I'd love to get John Spears on there just to capture his old Essex accent. There's yeah, so yeah. few people who often say they've got an Essex accent now. I mean, yeah. there's a few, but it's yeah. so strong. Yeah. You know, I'd love to get that just, just from the point of view of yeah. preserving this dialect for posterity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's practically died out now. Yeah. yeah, most of the kids around here speak history, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a variation of New York gangster, then, isn't it? Oh, Everyone wants terrible. to be a New York gangster now, don't they? Yeah, without consonants. <laughs> what was the what connection was between the Greyhound pub and the Greyhound track behind it? Right. Oh yes, in the, in the late 90s... I mean, the pub couldn't have been... Was the pub already called the Greyhound? Or yes, was it? the pub oh. was already called the Greyhound. The, the leaseholders of the pub, the brewery of the pub at the time, was called Cannon Brewery Company. And they had tenancies. You know, they used to have tight tenancies yes. in those days. Well, the brewery was basically in the business of selling beer, but they were also in the business of collecting pubs right. as outlets for selling beer. And then they used to employ it tied managers, right? A tied manager was somebody who they put into the property on a lease, who then agreed to sell their beer mm. from the outlet. So it was, a, it was a force, you know, if you want yeah. to lease that property, you've got to buy our beer and nobody else's. Yeah. So it was a way of containing control, though. So, so you've got this sort of kind of I think that was the case until about 1980. And uh, Mann's beer and Trotney beer Trotten's. and Truman's yeah. and all sorts. And, and all these pubs were all known by the beer manufacturer or the label. Yeah. Right, well, this one was an Iron de Coupe pub. Right. Um, the leaseholder of the property at the time um, effectively was usurped by somebody who bought the land around the pub, freehold, which was, at the time, unusable land. 
because the only right of access to the Leverage Road was the pub. All the rest of the, the, the estate didn't have a right of access onto the, onto the road right. because there used to be a stream that ran along the side of the road. There was, because this was marshland, there was streams all over the place. Mm -hmm. On the edge of this property was a stream that went all the way around oh, right. and, and went and joined into the cut and stuff. Right. And along the side of Leebridge Road on this side, there was a stream and there was a set of cottages just behind the, the stream, stream yeah. which is now where Craigie's plant hire is. Right. Uh, the, the land that was all at the back there, didn't have the access to the road because of the stream. So the only access to the road was through the pub. So what the guy did cleverly was to buy all this freehold land, which was all at a low value because it didn't have a right of access. And yeah. it was basically, it was unusable. Mm -hmm. And decided that uh, he had this grand plan to turn it into a motor speedway. That's right, yeah. And so he had to get permission from the brewery to use it as a motor speedway. He also had to get permission from the lease, the under, the head leaseholder, which is Lou's predecessor and title, to use the land for other than licensed premises. Mm -hmm. So they had to manipulate all the land details to do with the license, because by including the pub as the the piece of the jigsaw that fitted to the land around it, so that the the right of access to the property gave the right of access to all this other land. So it meant, oh, all of a sudden there's loads and loads of land that can be used. Right. And by making it a speedway, big oval track. When did the speedway open? 1929, I think. Yeah, I think it was the 20s. Um, they did something like it in the local paper. the guy who was running it at that time, the guy called John Noseworthy, and he was involved with the local council. He was the director of the Motor Speedway Company and he acquired this lease for the pub and managed to persuade the brewery to come on board and for them to grant him a license to sell beer, not only at the pub, but also for use on the motor speedway. So his friendly people on the council, I think it turned out, I think it was somebody on Hackney Council who actually came onto the board of the motor speedway company. But it was obviously the local, uh, local magistrates were involved mm. with this property as well. It was also, it was also, uh, it was a Freemasonry headquarters. This was actually a lodge. Oh. We found uh, the uh, triangle and ruler emblem somewhere on one of the, one of the walls. And oh, it was right. actually, a, it was a, a Masonic lodge. Well, what the Masons are favourite, what their what their favourite tricks is, the sort of things that's going on with the LDTC and the Olympics thing, and that's all Masonry as well, is, is land scams. Well, what they did with this place was a land scam because the property, the pub, was already on a lease that was running. It was a thousand year lease. On top of that, because this other piece of land had been added onto the side, there was another thousand year lease which made a bigger, newer greyhound, which was then rebuilt and everything, done away with the stables, moved the pub sideways. So that's when this outer wall moved the, moved became the, an inner wall. Yeah. <laughs> the, the cottages that were on the side and the right of way that was on the side got demolished and the new piece of land to the west became the new right of way to the back of the property. And that became the entrance to... Is that big approach? That became the entrance to the Motor Speedway Estate, ah. which is part of the 1888 lease to the Greenhound. Right. And it remains to this day part of the 1888 lease to the Greyhound. <laughs> the council say it's rig approach. I say it's not. It's the 1888 lease to the Greyhound. You'd think there would be an easy way for someone to just sit down, look at the documents well, and say... You can't get anybody to do anything easy when you're saying that what they're doing is wrong they've got to pay you compensation. They deny all knowledge of it and say, no, 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 we've got millions of pounds, we'll fight you. So they make you fight them with their millions of pounds. Now this is where I say, this is where the law's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. A local authority is on behalf of the public. Now the public aren't doing this to Lou. No. Someone in the council's doing this to Lou. Right? And that someone in the council is simply saying, 
On behalf of the public, we're going to put you to all this difficulty because we don't want to pay you compensation for having stolen your land unlawfully. We made a mistake, sorry, here's your land back. No, they can't do so that. So the council now claims to own that? Council say they own it. But they can't own it. It's leased. Whoever sold it to them didn't own it to sell it to them. It, it always annoys me that the local paper, whenever we try to say anything about what they're doing, always focus on the fact that it's open space, therefore it's an environmental issue. Now, you try, talking, you try talking to an environmentalist, someone from the Green Party, someone from the Hornby yeah, Environmental yeah. Centre, they haven't a clue what I'm talking about and why should they? Right. Because what we're, what we're doing is not to do with environmental issues, it's to do with rights, access issues, yeah. human rights, right. our right to the land. When, when it's we, not to do with you know, what's growing on it or how it's used. When we were dealing with the M11, one of the biggest problems we had was that there was a huge media push to promote roads and cars and yeah. everything. Now one of the people who was involved in that deeply had a massive media industry business associated with motors. Michael Axel died. Oh, yeah. He was pouring millions of pounds into media to promote mm. roads, yeah. cars, transport, blah 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 blah. And lo and behold, I heard all these connections, there's all well. these connections with all these people at ministerial level that have all got these connections with all these yeah. corporate bodies. Christopher Chope, Steve And Morris all the people that are them. all making millions out of building roads. And they are selling petrol and cars and God knows what. Oh yeah, nice business if you're in it. But if it tramples across people's ordinary common rights and property rights, isn't it morally wrong? You know? I remember, I remember do, the day, do know the, the that, day that they went for the treehouse in Monstead and all the media were up there. Mm -hmm. Remember the place was full of television and Barbara Zemetska was wearing her little black hat with the yeah. black veil. Yeah. And um, there was that lovely bit which they showed on every news broadcast with Jackie Carpenter shouting, Unclean filth! And yeah. all the news. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And the day that that was going on, they went down um, Philibrook Road and Grove Green Road and everyone was up at Wanstead for that tree, which was hollow and about full down anyway. And everyone was up there yeah, for... Queen Victoria gave that tree. I know Queen Victoria gave that tree, she's dead. But anyway, everyone was up there for the tree, you know, it was... And you know, this whole, you know, this whole sort of media circus going on up there. And in Philibrook Road and Grove Green Road they took back 69 houses because there was no one in the houses, they'd all gone up there to get themselves on the telly. Yeah. And the process was supposed to have been about the fact it was taking everyone's houses. Yeah. It wasn't about one uh, superannuated well, chestnut tree, no matter who gave it to the I was in the courts like, I was. know, I know. Extraordinary, but that, but extraordinarily, ongoing... I, was, I was in Ireland that day, and uh, I was in a hotel that had a power cut, and terrible, there was a terrible storm blew in, and... Um, uh, I happened to w turn on the um, television, I don't know, got some bloody American channel or something, and uh, that was the number one item on the news on that um, that uh, television station in Ireland. I saw the tree mm. in uh, Wanstead. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I would never have seen if I'd have been round here. Yeah. Oh, funny. I'm now standing on the ground floor of what was what was shown on the plans as being the shops which is part of the 1840 lease, which is Lou's lease. And this is part of the 120 foot dimension, which is the land shown on all the documentation as being the land that was the two cottages. To the west of us, up against an, uh, a wall at that side of the property, was a 20 foot right of way. When the shops were constructed between 1888 and 1904, this property was extended so that the land that was in front of the pub, which was the right of access, which went on that side over there and went to the rear of the property, the right of access came through the arch at the far east of the property, in front of the property on what's called a draw-up in front of the property, along behind where I'm standing here, and down and round to the back of the property on the western side of the property. So you sort of zigzag through the arch, crossing front of the property and down 
the western side of the road to the north. Now, what happened in between 1888 and 1904, this other lease was created by the addition of an additional piece of land which was joined to the property. And that piece of land was necessary to create the existing rights of way that were in the 1840 lease. So that the rights of way on the 1840 lease were transposed onto the new additional piece of land so that the original right of way was not extinguished but simply transferred to the new parcel of land which was freehold instead of being leasehold it was freehold and a new lease was created the 1888 lease which extended the right of way down to the rear of the property and that was necessary because the two cottages were being demolished so that three shops could be built also at the same time the pub was being rebuilt so that it adjoined the bridge by an amendment to the 1836 Railway Act, which I believe was 1888 itself. Now it was only that amendment to the Railway Act that enabled the property as is now to be joined to the bridge such that the part of the property that became joined to the bridge, which is the other side of this wall, which is the ground floor of the Greyhound, which I'm standing next to here, which was the original right of access to the property. You came in through the arch into the ground floor of the Greyhound. You came across in front of the ground, front, ground floor of the Greyhound, the right way to the rear garden, which again is ground floor. I'm now standing on the ground floor. When Tom Hammond made a claim for this in 1971, he demolished the shops that were here, that were the 1888 leaseholders shops, and he filled this in with earth to the road level and he said it was land, and he claimed that this was all land. And by the time of the court case, he was claiming that the building, this building here, in front of this piece of land, was also his land and his forecourt. And in the court cases, it's been referred to as the forecourt. And in the court case, Lou said, it's not, it's the roof of my pub. And the reason it's the roof of his pub is, it's a structure. Here is the land, here is the structure above ground, which is a physical building. This is the original brickwork, which has been repaired by Lou, or by Lou's builders. There is the original brickwork at the back here, and that forms the outer wall of the internal building, which is between here and the bridge. And we can go into the property and, and walk around inside that property from the ground floor of the Greyhound. It only has access from the Greyhound. This original wall has no access to that physical structure. When the shops were constructed, they were constructed in such a way that this part of the property here, which has had to be repaired because it's all been seriously damaged by Mr. Hammond's demolition work, and Lou has had the builder recreate what was there originally, which was these chutes which were originally coal chutes, which were just at the bottom of the steps. This would have been the doorstep for the property, going into the property which was built above here, and there were joists. And there are there's signs there in the wall where the adjoining wall, which divided the property into the three shops. So you've got two dividers at 16 foot distances on a 48 foot lot, which show how the property was divided up. Can you see these signs now, Henry? Pardon? Can you see these signs now? Could you yes. point them out? Yes. I can point well, show, them out. show me. Here, just here. These are these are the keys here, where the where the wall was keyed in originally, which went from this wall here, perpendicular, going north, which created the 16 foot shop at this point, and then from this point on, going in that direction, another 16 foot. There is the keys for the second shop wall, which was the second shop going in that direction. So these were the ground floors to the shops. And as I say, in front of those shops, clearly identifiable with these coal shoes here, which is original brickwork, which when you go on the inside of the property, on the other side of the wall, and look, there is quite complex architectural brickwork because being designed so that it was 
adjacent to the bridge. It was, it was part of the process of building it. It had to be given torsional strength from a width perspective and a length perspective. So the arches are designed in such a way you have the long loping arches which prevent compression from the side from the weight of the road on the side. That's the second set of keys by Tom Hammond. Lou's had the wall repaired and renovated back up to road level, just as a safety measure to stop people from falling into the hole. That's been approved by the council, they've accepted that. Here's the original wall. We're talking about long sloping arches. Yeah. Just this, this is the original brickwork for the uh, for what was effectively the coal chute, which came through from the upper level and shot in underneath the doorstep where the sling is, which had been put in, which shows that original wall. When you look from the inside of the property, you can see that the brickwork that's behind it was quite complex in its in its uh, method of construction. It has these long loping arches that prevent torsional pressure from the build-up of the land on the road from pushing the buildings together this way. So they're designed to prevent compression from a sideways force. You also have these very short upright arches which prevent the compression from the weight from dropping down from above so that it supports the weight. You also, on the inside, have this amazing circular brickwork forming these vaulted ceilings, which is what everybody calls the vaults, and says are underground. They are not underground. It is an above ground structure. The fact that it has vaulted brickwork has nothing to do with whether it's above ground or below ground. It's just simply a terminology that's used to describe a form of brickwork structure. It's a curved arch made of bricks. Skilled brick workers used to do this sort of thing. And Bridges are renowned for it. Everyone's seen the pictures of bridges with these wonderful arches. That's all it is. It's the same structure, but done on the inside of the building. And that building was only done by an amendment to the Railway Act, which allowed the pub to be joined. So that the, the, the structure behind here now, this building behind here now, the surface of which everybody calls the forecourt, which isn't a forecourt at all, it's actually the roof of a part of the Greyhound, because the only access to it is from inside that building. And the only access inside that building is either from the other side of the bridge, under the arch in, in the existing 1840 entrance, or from above on the first floor level on the 1888 lease level. When you're, in, when you're in court next, uh, Henry? Well, the next process that's supposed to be going on is there's an attempt to try to use the last core holder, which was complete load of tosh. Um, the, the judge decided that Lou had nicked the basement of the shops, and that this was all part and parcel of the shops. This is proof that he's wrong. And because he didn't come here and see it, and because there was no expert, they're all talking rubbish. And this is clear, identifiable proof that they're talking rubbish and the court order is not worth the paper it's written on. Basically what the court is saying is that the person who bought the rubbish from Tom Hammond is entitled to register this at first floor level as being their land. And I'm saying well you can't register at first floor level when Lou already has the ground floor level on his lease. Until that is decided as to what you're doing about Lou's ground floor level, you can't put anything above it because the law of the land is you own from the centre of the earth to the sky. And if Lou owns from the centre of the earth to the sky, how does somebody get to interject another lease on top of it or another title on top of it? Land law prohibits it. So the court are statutory barred from doing it. The land registry are statutory barred from doing it. And, as I said to Lou, in technical terms, it's a theft of his property. It's a contract, right? It's a contract. The contract is that they look after it. That's what vesting is. They look after it on behalf of the public, not that they own it.
Yeah. There's a total difference between ownership and vesting of management powers. Right? A vesting of management powers is the same as happens with the roads. Road, many roads in London are privately owned land. Mm. They're not registered at the land registry. I've talked about this before. There is a flaw in the land law in this country in that many, many people own land but do not have control over it. If you own something, you're supposed to control it. You're supposed to have the right to receive income from it, the right to preserve it. For beneficial it interest. You're supposed to have the right to convey it mm. and do what you will with it. And you're supposed to be able to repel borders. In other words, you can evict trespassers. Now, the way that it's happening at the moment is because that land is not registered to the owners, people that use this phrase, like, oh, the council owns it. The council keep claiming it's theirs. No, 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 it's not yours. You have a contract with the private owners to maintain the surface as a navigable right of way. That's it. That's all that you have. You have a contract. Mm. Now, for them to say we own is an abrogation of their legal rights and their legal powers. You cannot convert a management contract into a title. A land title is something very specific in law. It's a common law thing because ultimately the crown owns all the land. The crown yeah. is the symbol in English law of God mm. in history. That's what it was. It was the crown power. It was the divine power of God. So God owns the land. Now, in other religions, and half the reason we're having problems with other religions is because a lot of the world's religions don't allow ownership of land. Absolutely. So we have an automatic conflict between our legal system that says that you can own something and another religion that says you can't. And this, now, this is one of the things that... We have that to resolve the, these you know, with, with Irish history, one of the big things that happened was that the Irish chieftains, the Uri, were kings over the people. Yeah. They were not kings over the land. Red Indians, the same. You know, and, and when Henry VIII went over there and said, I'm the king, the and went through the whole surrender and regrant process, it wasn't just a case of them giving their rights to him and becoming their vassals or their, you know, you know, whatever the next thing was down in the feudal system. But they were literally, he thought, giving him their land. Mm. And they didn't see it that way because they didn't own title to the land. They only ruled the people who lived in the lands where they lived. I don't know if you and remember. And I don't think Henry VIII got that. I don't know if you remember it. When we were doing the campaign, one of the things that came to light, there was this story. I can't remember. It was the Red Indian who said that if we are to regard the land as being anything, we should regard it as belonging to our children and we look after it for them. Oh, that's right. Do um, you remember it? I remember, I, seeing, remember. I remember seeing it on a poster. It, 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 uh, I think it was first quoted by Susan George in Only One Planet. It's, um, we, do, we do not inherit the earth, we borrow it from our children. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's the, that's the essence of the difference in thinking about yeah. what, what the sort of thing I was talking about in the original Agenda 21 meeting. The difference of an agenda where you talk about something not as we own it, we control it, we manipulate it, we do this, that and the other. That's all to do with consumption. Right? We consume this planet was the essence of all the old way of looking at things. We've consumed it to death. We have to stop. We have to stop. We have to have a different model. And that different model is it's not ours. We borrow it from our children. Because if we don't look at it in that way, there is no survival, survival, survivability for the human race, which, oh, makes, us all, which makes us all idiots. And I don't believe that we've survived as a human race all this time by being idiots. So we've either, we've either elected idiots into power who've persuaded everybody else that they're all idiots, or the people who have the common sense are being kept out of the conversation loop. I think it's right. that being kept out of the conversation loop. And it's, 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 it's something we're increasingly it's hearing. See, the word, the word common sense, it's, yeah. that's the thing. Common sense, common voice, common law, they're all the, one and the same thing. They, they it all comes down to, I'm a human being, I just live here. Our common humanity. You know, this is my planet. Nobody can say it's not my planet. It is my planet, it's my home. 